All right, we're getting started. This is John Criswell at UIUC. All right, so uh, as you said, I'm John Criswell from the University of Illinois. Um, and today I'll be talking about how we use um, LVM for uh, creating a secure virtual architecture. Um, so first, what is it? Um, what we're essentially trying to do is we're trying to create a compiler-based virtual machine that we can place below an operating system and below the applications um, running on a machine. Um, we can use this virtual machine to enforce security policies for all software in the system, including the operating system. Our motivation for building it is twofold. Um, the first reason is that kernel code um, can be exploited. Um, I think for a long time, um, Many of you sort of had this myth that you have to trust the operating system and it's the basis of your security, so forth and so on. But uh, recent work in the, uh, in the security community has uh, demonstrated that operating system code is just as vulnerable um, and exploitable as uh, user space code. Uh, secondly, um, by placing the virtual machine um, below the operating system, um, we are hoping to be able to perform analysis across traditional, uh, traditional um, application kernel boundaries such as the system call boundary. So there were some MIT based, well, MIT has some plans of working that so are you aware of that? That I'm, that I'm not aware of. I know that there's been one workshop paper on whole system analysis, okay. and they used, to, they used different infrastructures uh, so for doing something. Okay. I'm very bad with names, but I can. Okay. So the whole idea is having a virtual machine sort of set up the application so you capture any kind of uh, no, um, as, you'll, as you'll see, we use our virtual machine a bit differently than that. So, so here's some more uh, detailed diagram of our architecture. So um, at the lowest level, we have the hardware, of course. Um, above that, we have our, our uh, SDA virtual machine. Um, the components in blue are the components that are currently in LVM today. So they include the analyzer, optimizer, code generator, and profiler. Um, in our research work, we've added two components. The first component is the orange component, which is the OS interface. And that is essentially a set of instructions that we've added to LVM to be able to support operating system level code. Um, the second thing that we've added a little bit more recently um, is the red boxes, and that basically provides memory safety um, for the operating system kernel. So what we do is we've made some minor modifications to the OS memory allocator, so that informs the virtual machine of uh, when it allocates memory, where it begins, and how long it is. And then the memory safety component within the virtual machine enforces memory safety, so it ensures that when we reference the point we're accessing an object of the correct type. Oh, one other thing I should add. Uh, you'll notice this uh, box over here which has um, cache translations and profiling information. Um, it is our belief that we do not want to co-generate the kernel and the, app and the applications at runtime all the time. So we believe that uh, caching translations and compiling ahead of time uh, is key to good performance in the system. So the majority of this talk I'll spend um, talking about the instructions that we added to LVM to be able to support um, an operating system kernel. Um, operating systems require two pieces of functionality. Um, the first part is hardware control. So operating systems do things such as uh, performing input and output, uh, installing interrupt and system call handlers, configuring the memory management unit, etc. The second thing that operating systems do, which is somewhat unique um, compared to application programs, is that they do a lot of state manipulation. So they manipulate the state of the current processor, such as they do for context switching. And then they also have to manipulate, this, manipulate the state of other programs on the system, such as for signal handler dispatch. So the first set of instructions that we added for hardware control. Uh, most of these are fairly straightforward. Um, we have uh, functions for registering um, system call interrupt and exception handlers. Uh, we have instructions to do uh, I.O. reads and writes. Um, you can essentially think of these as load store instructions. Uh, the major difference is that the I.O. address um, belongs to the I.O. address space, which is not necessarily the same as the uh, address space for the RAM. Um, the other difference is that Essentially, these instructions abstract away the special addressing modes or instructions or memory barriers that you would need to add as assembly code later um, in order to do I.O. correctly. So certain processors like x86 require have special conditions for I.O. And 
these instructions look trying to follow that away. Uh, we also did atomic operations, which I think might be of interest in the concurrency discussion we'll have later today. Uh, we have um, LDA swap and phi, where phi can be an add, a subtract, um, and, or, XOR, etc. Um, in practice, we only use uh, swap and add and swap and or, I think. So, for yeah. Linux. Yes, for Linux. So, and uh, we also have uh, LDA compare and swap. And then finally, we have uh, we've done some basic memory management intrinsics as well. Uh, we currently we built the uh, instruction set to use um, our work page table. Um, when designing for a particular family of processors, we expect that you'll have to choose either between a software TLB or hardware TLB system, and then, then design your intrinsics accordingly. So, but once you one, once you pick one set, you should be able to use that for the entire lifetime of that family processor. Uh, was there a question? Okay. And the second thing we need to do is we need to handle state manipulation. And what we decided to do is we decided to allow the OS to know about the existence of the state, but not be able to interpret it. So basically, for a lot of uh, operations, the operating system really doesn't care what the state is. It just wants to do something very simple with it. It wants to take it off the processor, put it on the processor, or do some sort of uh, high-level operation to it. So we allow it to manipulate the native state, but only as basically a bag of bits that it doesn't really understand the meaning of. So if you noticed several slides previously, this right here, um, so when we register a system call, there's a new parameter at the beginning of your interrupt and traffic noise. It's called the interrupt context. You can essentially think of this as the saved, saved state of the interrupted program. So now, for efficiency, we don't actually want to save the entire processor state when we enter the kernel. So we want to be able to take advantage of uh, low latency interrupt facilities such as shadow registers or register windows. And so the question is, how do we do this? So what the interrupt context is, it's a subset of the processor state that's saved on the kernel stack when we uh, when we when an interrupt occurs or a system call occurs and we enter into the execute we enter into our virtual machine, um, which then saves a subset of the state on the kernel stack before calling into the operating system. And what we can do is we can leave state that we know that the operating system is not going to use on the processor. And we know what state the operating system will use because we co-generated it. And then finally, there are certain cases where the operating system will, in fact, want to commit the entire interrupt context to memory. Um, typically, it needs to do this on a context switch when it's switching from one process to another. So we provide an additional instruction that allows it to say, hey, I've got a pointer to an interrupt context. I need you to take anything that's on the processor and commit it to memory if it hasn't already been done. And so in this way, if you're just entering the kernel and then going to go back out, then you don't need to bother saving the entire state. We can, only, we can get away with only saving the subset of it. Oh, yes. And then, as I mentioned previously, the pointer to the interrupt context is passed to um, all the functions that are entry points for the kernel. 